In this video, we're going to look at additional features and properties of the probability density. So we've already established that we can calculate the probability density using the square of the wave function for our given system. Right? What I want to do in this video is look at a specific example and point out some additional properties of the probability density. So the specific case that I want to look at is the case that we introduced in the last lecture, which is the free particle. So this was a free traveling particle with no potential acting on it. And we saw that it had a wave function solution that looked like this. Now we'll look further into what the constants A and B are and how they're defined uh, in a later unit. But right now, just keep in mind that those are just constants um, and K is just a constant for the free particle. So this is our wave function. And, and note that this wave function is constructed as what we call a superposition. Now, what is a superposition? A superposition is just a fancy way of saying like a linear combination of functions. And a linear combination is just a fancy way of saying, you know, two functions added together, right? So basically you don't have a single function. You have a sum of multiple different functions. That's what a superposition is. And we'll also talk more about this uh, property in detail in a, in a lecture soon. But I wanted to just point out that this is constructed as a superposition of functions. So let's say what happened, what would happen if we, um, you know, take one of these functions away, let's say we set B equal to zero. So if we set the constant B equal to zero, that simplifies our wave function to only be this single function, uh, a e to the I K X, right? This just simplifies our wave function down to that. What if we calculate a probability uh, density for this guy. So if we calculate the probability density right the probability density is just the square of this wave function. So um, and keep in mind it's the square modulus right so we're really taking the um, the modulus of one and multiplying it to the original function, right? So since we do have an imaginary number here, that is going to come into play. So we do a e to the i k x. We're going to take the modulus of that guy, multiply it by the original function, e to the i k x. Right, so that's going to give us, um, let me just distribute this, um, this modulus here because technically our constant could also be an imaginary number, right? So you're gonna have A star, which would be the modulus of A, and this um, exponential, this imaginary number in the exponential would just become negative. So we'll have E to the negative IKX times A E to the IKX. Right. So um, you would end up with a star a. A star times a and these uh, negative i k x is in the exponents of the exponentials would actually cancel out since you have one negative one positive. So you would actually get e to the zero. So that's going to be one. So the final answer here ends up being a squared. Right. The square modulus of a is your probability distribution. So what does this mean? This means that the probability density in this case is independent of X, right? We, we no longer have X here, right? So the probability density is completely independent of X. So what that would look like graphically, right? I've kind of plotted that here. Basically any, at any point in space, you would have a constant probability of finding the particle in that region of space, right? So essentially of what that means is that you don't really know where the particle is, right? If you, if you don't have any dependence on its location and you just have a constant probability of finding it everywhere, then you have absolutely no clue where the particle actually is, right? You can't just have a, a same probability of, of finding the particle at all points in space, right? So, so here we see a, a case where this would be a valid solution to Schrodinger's equation for the free particle. But it wouldn't um, you wouldn't get all the properties of the free particle, all the properties, the proper properties of the free particle. So um, so what we're going to do here is take another route instead of um, getting rid of one of those functions. 
we're going to assume that A and B are equal. So we keep both functions there, both functions present. So let's assume A is equal to B. Right, so if we assume that A is equal to B, then we have the following function, right? So our wave function becomes this. We'll have A e to the i k x plus A e to the negative i k x, right? So since A and B are both equal, I'm just going to call them both A, right? So we can add and multiply these things together. Um, so we have both of those, right? So we can actually factor out that constant A. So we just end up with e to the i k x plus e to the negative i k x. Okay, so what I want to do is use Euler's relationship in order to re-express these exponentials. So we're going to uh, use Euler's relationship just so that it's easier to plot these things and visualize them. So using Euler's relationship. we can re-express this wave function in the following way, right? So we'll have the wave function, a cosine kx plus i sine kx, right? So Euler's relationship is actually really useful because you can separate out the real and imaginary components for any function, right? So this is the first function uh, rewritten using Euler's relationship. You can see we have this real uh, function, um, cosine function, and an imaginary sine function, right? So you can uh, split those imaginary and real components using Euler's relationship. And then for the second exponential, you'll have cosine kx minus i sine kx, right? So you can see that we get a little bit of cancellation here. The I sine KX cancels out with negative I sine KX. And then so you're left with a cosine KX plus a cosine KX. Right, so you end up with a wave function that is two a cosine KX. So if we wanted to calculate a probability density here, right, we would just take the square of the wave function. And since we don't have any imaginary components, we can literally just multiply these together. So we will have four square modulus of A cosine squared KX. So this would be our probability density for the case where A and B are equal. Right. And I've plotted that here. So basically what you would get is a probability distribution that oscillates between zero and four a squared. So we haven't normalized this yet, so it wouldn't go from zero to one, but it would go from zero to four a squared. Right. So one feature that I want to point out here, right, is that this probability density is going to have portions where it is equal to zero, where the wave function crosses zero. At points where the wave function crosses zero, that means there's no probability of finding the particle at that location. So we call those nodes. So this is a node. Basically, a node is anywhere where the probability of finding that particle is zero. So location, a point where the wave function crosses zero. And we call those nodes. And, and they'll be very interesting features to point out for any system that we look at. It'll be interesting to see um, where those locations are where we won't find the particle or those energy levels where we won't find the particle. So um, so yeah, so that's a feature. So I wanted to point out the, this feature of the node of the probability density and kind of show you a sketch of what one would look like, right? So um, unlike the wave function, which can have positive and negative values, the probability density is always going to be positive since it's squared and it's going to oscillate back and forth uh, between different probability values. And in this case, it's oscillating from zero to a max of 4a squared for this function, right? Um, and so this is why they're usually these trig functions. They oscillate back and forth. They satisfy these equations. So um, these are really useful features of functions for the probability density.